Natalie Dupree Cooks is made possible in part by Publix Supermarkets. Publix is pleased to support this and other quality public broadcasting programs. Hello, I'm Natalie Dupree. For today's menu, I'm serving minted pea soup, oven barbecued pork tenderloin, mashed potatoes, and a braided basil ring. Coming up next. Onions are wonderful to keep in the house because if you have an onion, it seems to me you can always get by. Now let me just go ahead and turn on my burners here, which I had kind of forgotten to do, and show you how to make this wonderful minted pea soup because that's another ingredient that you can always keep on hand. If you have some frozen peas in the cupboard, I mean in the freezer, <laughs> not in the cupboard, <laughs> in the freezer, you can always make something. In this case, it's a fabulous, fabulous soup. I uh, served it just the other day when we had some company, and I loved it again. Now, uh, in a large pot, I'm going to melt some butter. I'm going to get this in here, and then add some onions, and just cook them for five minutes or so until they're soft. How long it takes depends on how broad the surface area is in your pot. If you have a, a short, squatty pot, it's going to take you, um, I mean, a or a tall pot even, but a narrow one, it's going to take you a lot longer to cook those onions rather than a broad pot. Also, if you cover them, they'll cook faster because they, the steam from above kind of helps cook them faster. So uh, just what's happening in the pan tells you a lot about how long something's going to take to cook. Then I'm going to go ahead and add some garlic as soon as those are soft. And that's all chopped up. You know, I don't care if you use the kind of garlic that comes in a jar in the refrigerator pre-chopped. I don't like it as well, I find, but it's certainly fine for desperation meals, so don't worry about that. And then go ahead and add some, you know, cook that mm, three to five minutes, but you don't want to brown them. You just want to soften them. And then you add some chicken stock. Oop, canned chicken broth. Try not to slop it all over everywhere. Pay attention to what you're doing. I say, not as I do, and then add some peas here. A gracious plenty of, poison, of frozen peas. Now bring them to a boil, lower the heat, and simmer it to about 15 minutes until the peas are soft. Now don't overcook them. I overcooked mine slightly, and they're a little grayer than I'd like them to be over here. And then you cook them till the peas are soft, and then you take them out and you strain them out into a strainer, which I have here, and puree them. I use something like this. This is a Chinese implement to get my peas out on, or a slotted spoon, which I think is one of those essential things to have in the kitchen at all times. So I'm going to put them in a food processor. You could use a blender if you wanted to. And if your peas get a little discolored like these are, then um, you're probably going to want to add just a little green food coloring to bump up the color a little bit. I'll, I'll see how it looks. And, and just puree it until they're smooth. Sometimes you need just a little broth to, uh, to make it go a little, a little faster in the blender or in the food processor. So let me just add a little here. Let's get over drained. Do a little better. Get them nice and smooth. How about just a little bit more of that broth before I add it back to my stock? Ooh, it's so good, too. Now, here we go. Well, it did keep its color. It's much prettier now that it's pureed. Now, recently, I got this far, and then I had to stop for one reason or the other. Don't do that. That's a little dangerous, but I just wanted to clean out that clean everything off of that blade. I'll show you a better, safer way to clean off the blade in a second. Um, and so I just froze this mixture at this point and then added my stock and didn't even have any cream, so I used milk. I was just kind of desperate for something. I invited some people over and I was out of town and I didn't get back too late, so I 
scrounged around in the freezer and that's what I found. This is the easiest way to clean off the blade. Put your blade back in there and then turn it on and then go back and it has spun everything off of your blade rather than doing which is what I was doing which was pretty dumb. And go ahead here and clean every last bit of your goodness out of your bowl. And then I'm going to add my cream pan, my cream, and my mint. And I always think that peas need just a little sugar, don't you? Just a little sugar. So let's go ahead here and add it over here. I've got myself on the opposite end from my bowl with my ladle now, but that's all right. I'll stir in my cream. Just a little sugar here. Just a little. And <laughs> just a little salt. And then stir it, give it a good stir. Heat it through. You can do this on the, on the uh, heat if you'd like. And add some nice chopped mint. There we are. And let me just ladle it up for you so you can see how pretty it is in a contrasting bowl like this. It's just absolutely gorgeous. And now, let's talk about just a few other things that you can have in your freezer um, that will get you by. For instance, if you didn't have any of the peas, you might do a lovely spinach soup with pureed spinach like this. And you might, rather than using the fresh mint, you might choose to do another herb altogether like oregano or uh, marjoram, something that would go with it better. Here we go here. And alternately, broccoli would be nice. All sorts of things freeze very, very well. So now, let's go from my kitchen here in New York to my kitchen at home in Atlanta. It's very important when you have a good oven, nonetheless, to be sure you know how to make it work for you. That way you can cook ahead and freeze ahead so that you'll always have something good to eat. This is a self-cleaning oven, which means that it seals very tightly and holds the heat very well. It has a nice large cavity, which means that if you have two or three baking sheets, you can maybe put them all in the oven. The trick is you always have to be sure that there's enough room in here for all the air to circulate around it. Nonetheless, the heat is different at the bottom than on the top. It's supposed to be because you want some things to brown on the bottom and some to brown on the top. Therefore, if in doubt, put an oven thermometer right next to the dish that you're cooking so that you can tell what temperature it really is where you're going. This is a very thick dish. It will cook differently than this metal dish, which is just about the same size, but not quite. This one looks nearly the same size, but it's much smaller. The one that's in the oven would then cook differently for a casserole and also for roasting. If you had a chicken that you were roasting, for instance, in this wide pan, the chicken itself might be nice and beautiful and brown, but your juices might be dried up because the pan is so large. If you put a little liquid in there, then you would probably have perfect juices for a gravy. So it just depends on what you're going to do in the pan and you have to make some little mental adjustments. A chicken roasted in here would be very nice, but it might be steaming on you. And then yet again, you have a roasting bag, which is wonderful. All three of these pans cook differently. Although they seem nearly the same size, there is a slight variation. Each of them will take a little different temperature cooking and the heat will penetrate differently depending on whether or not it's glass, whether or not it's shiny, or whether or not it's dark and well used. So don't blame your oven, don't blame the recipe, but take another look at your equipment. Now let me show you these fabulous oven barbecued pork tenderloins. In a food processor, you combine onion. And this is a blender, in case you hadn't noticed. And it's every bit as good for something like this as the food processor, I think. Might be just a little full. I may have to do it in batches. We've got some onion and some garlic. A little bit of tomato paste here. And I've told you before that you can freeze tomato paste. Just open your can and uh, use what you want to. Don't let it go green in there. 
in the refrigerator and, and take and dollop it out on something, freeze it flat, and then uh, pop it into a covered container and just leave it in your freezer and pull it out as you need it. Little honey. You would never let your tomato paste turn green in your refrigerator, would you? You know, it's still safe if you said, but you should scrape off the green. It's not very appealing. Some Worcestershire sauce or Worcestershire sauce and some uh, vinegar, red wine vinegar, a little orange juice. Now I'm getting to the point where it might blow up on my face, so I better just go ahead here now and process it. Well, all I have left is lemon juice. How bad could it be? And a little cayenne pepper. Cross your fingers, I don't get covered. And up I go. There we go. Now, that's a nice thick puree, and I'm gonna pour it over the pork. Now, you know I'm lazy. These are nice two little pork tenderloins. They surely are nice. Uh, I keep them in the freezer, and I would not dirty up a dish for this. I would put it in a plastic bag and put it in my refrigerator and leave it there for about six hours. So you can do that the night before or early in the morning. I find it's helpful when, you're, when the dishwasher's running and you've just finished cleaning up the sink. If you do a few things like this, do a final cleanup of the kitchen, and then the next day all you have to do is come home and run it into the oven. So now I've got some over here. Let me just get my hot pads right here. As you remove it from the marinade and bake it at 350 degrees. I'll just show you this. Now, this is on a rack in a roasting pan. You really don't need to do that either. You can put it flat right down on there. And I am also lazy enough that I would cover this with foil uh, at home so that I wouldn't have to wash it or put it in a pan maybe with a little bit of foil. Bake it at 350 until a meat thermometer inserted in the pork reads 150 degrees. Trichinosis, if there were any in the United States, and there's very little, if not none, um, trichinosis is killed at 140 degrees. So 150 degrees is more than a good temperature for the pork. Um, and it, it takes anywhere for half, from half an hour to uh, 50 minutes to cook this pork. But you don't want it overcooked. Uh, and it depends very much on whether or not you put it in from the refrigerator while it's cold, then it will take you longer rather than if you get it down to room temperature. So let me go ahead and pull this out. Here this is, it's very nice and done. And you pour your reserved marinade into a shallow pan, which I have done there, and you just bring it, to, I'll show you, I'll just show you the whole thing. I want to put this on my head over here. Um, and I'll put this over here. Because you have to boil it up. You see, you've had raw pork in there. And you certainly don't want to get lose all those luscious ingredients. So if you bring this up to the boil, then you'll be able to use it uh, for, the, for the meat when it's cooked. But if you don't do that, then you won't be able to use it because it's dangerous. Okay, so you bring it up to a boil and then you reduce the heat and you simmer it until it's thick, about 10 minutes. It's very nice. And then here we have our lovely finished sauce, which is nice and thick. And we'll pass it separately with the pork and I'll serve it warm or at room temperature. And then what I'm going to do now is to come back in just a second and show you how to make a wonderful, wonderful braided basil ring bread.
Now let's talk about this lovely braided basil ring bread. You know, if you have bread in the house and if you have bread cooking, you feel that all is right with the world. You don't feel like there's nothing else to eat because you can always figure out something if you have some bread. So here's the regular ratio of bread to liquid. The regular ratio is three cups of bread flour, preferably, to one cup of liquid. And it can be milk, water, buttermilk. Buttermilk's not as good, but milk or water, um, just about any kind of liquid that you can think of. I can't think of any more right now. <laughs> and uh, then you can stir in and, and uh, you can get started. So with the ratio is three to one. If you use eggs in place of the liquid, they also measure the same as the liquid, even though they're leavening. So that's just your ratio. It really has got to do with how wet the dough is. So the first thing that you want to do is to combine some active dry yeast, in this case, with some warm water. And the packaged yeast require a little sugar. Uh, the yeast, yeast is alive. It's right here in the air, growing all the way around us. All right here, here's some yeast, and here's some yeast. Well, it has to feed on something, and what it's feeding on in here is the sugar that's that's in in this bowl. But it's really um, in many cultures it's unnecessary because the yeast is growing wild and uh, does, they don't require the sugar. For instance, if you live in San Francisco or one of the or New Orleans, you'll find that your bread will have a much more wonderful flavor, and that's because of all the yeast that's in the air that comes in off of the ocean and, and seems to add more flavors. And it's nobody really understands why. When I lived in in Majorca, there was a, a very special bread, an ensamida, that was made in Barcelona, and they swore that the ensamidas uh, in Barcelona were so much better than anywhere in the world. And people would go and they would take the bread, the flour, they would take the yeast, they would take the water all from there and go anywhere else in the world and try to make the same product and they couldn't. It just didn't have that flavor and that's because of all this yeast. Now, if you only, in the, if the only thing you have in your house is the uh, instant rise yeast, then you would go ahead and add it right to your flour in the food processor. Bread flour is preferable, but if you don't have bread flour, you can use a little whole wheat flour, you can use some all-purpose flour. It's just that how much flour you add changes every day, and then it also changes with what kind of flour you have. So let me go ahead here now and add um, the rest of my ingredients here. I've got some some more sugar, I guess it's going to be a sweet one, some salt, and some basil. And you can use fresh or dried. I probably would prefer the fresh, but I have used the dried many a time. And then go ahead now and add your warm mixture. And I should have heated up, oop, it's over here, I'll show you this. This is my dissolved mixture, and I should have added my milk to my mixture. So. Here is a perfect example of things not being perfect. I've got just a little bit more liquid in here now than what I need, and I've got that yeast that didn't quite dissolve. That yeast will dissolve. The first rising, it might look a little freckled. I've had that happen before. But then by the second rising, it seems to dissolve fine, and by the time it's baked, it's gone. So the purpose of dissolving that particular yeast is, one, to prove that it's alive and foamy, like you saw in the yeast that I just put in there. But two, it's to dissolve those little freckles. So, But you know me, I'm a little scatterbrained, a little klutzy, and so I've done things like that at home before, and I've had to see what happens if it works. Now, I've got my warm mixture in there. I'm going to turn it on. And this is it. It's very, very hard. You see right here, it's very hard. I'm just going to let this process for about a minute until a very nice, soft dough forms and it, the dough is nice and elastic and it'll feel like a baby's bottom. Now that can take just a little more flour. You want it not to be sticky when you touch it and the way the food processor does is it chops it up, kneads it up and the insides come to the outsides just like that and that tells you what's being done when you touch it. Let me just see how it is now. We'll see now, it's not hardly sticking. 
And if I go like this and I touch it, it should bounce back. It's not quite there. Let me do it just a second more for you. Really hard to be cooking here in the kitchen, isn't it? Now you can always do this by hand. It's a great way to get out your aggressions. Now if you needed it by hand, now be careful when you pull it out because you don't want to cut yourself on that blade. If you need it by hand, you take it, you flour your board, you push in and around and keep moving like that. And that's the way you need. And you would keep doing that. It would take you about 10 minutes. Now, I didn't need that last little bit of flour. But look, see how angry it is? It's just bouncing back. It's, and if you really wanted to, I mean, I've known people who've thrown their dough just to get it kneaded. And uh, you can do that, too. So now put it in an oiled plastic bag or an oiled bowl. Or what you can do is put it back in your food processor bowl if you would like to. But it has to be oiled so that it doesn't form a skin. I just stick mine in a plastic bag usually and pop it in the, um, either in a warm place, um, not a radiator which would kill the yeast, but uh, just a nice warm place and I put it there until it has doubled. Or you can put it in the refrigerator until it's doubled. Here's one that's been in a warm place. Here's one that's been in the refrigerator and you can see they both work. Now let me just show you this one. It'll divide it into three nice braids and shape it. Here we go. If you put two fingers in, it, they don't bounce back. See? Okay, now divide it into three. And if you have a scale and can weigh your strands so that they're even, that is the best. And take and roll these out into strands. Or you can do baby ones for that matter. Now this could have gone just a little bit longer, probably, because it's going to want to see how it wants to go back. So in a perfect world, your ropes would be about 20 to 24 inches long. I'll make you one right now, though, which you'll get the idea. And then it does double again, so that'll relax it even more. Take, put three strands together, and yours will be nice and smooth. You'll row them smooth. You won't talk so much and then have to rush at the end. Now, take from the outside to the inside. The outside to the inside. Brush off that extra flour. Outside to the inside, outside to the inside, outside to the inside. And yours, get the end here, you sort of chuck under. And yours will be a nice long rope like that. You form it into a circle and pinch the ends to seal. And if you're concerned, you might have to put it around something like a bowl, like that, that would go into the oven to keep it out. Can you see how you would do that? Now, you cover it with plastic wrap, which prevents the skin from forming, and you let it double again. And then you pop it into the oven in a 400 degree oven, bake it on the middle rack until it's golden on top, and it should sound hollow when it's, the bottom is top, tapped. About 25 minutes. It reads 200 degrees on an instant thermometer. So you can see how beautiful it is here. Now you sprinkle the ring with the remaining teaspoon of basil and transfer for it to a wire rack to cool. And I should have brushed it with some butter. So now let me show you my whole meal right here. Minted pea soup, oven barbecued pork tenderloins, mashed potatoes, basil ring bread, and chocolate nut tort. Thanks for joining me. See you next time. All the recipes in this program and in the entire series are available in Natalie Dupree Cook's Everyday Meals from a Well-Stocked Pantry, published by Clarkson Potter. This book contains a collection of over 150 recipes complete with do-ahead and storage tips. Order your copy by calling the number on your screen. The price is $20 plus shipping and handling. Please have your credit card ready when you call 1-800-235-3000 for Natalie Dupree Cook's Everyday Meals from a Well-Stocked Pantry.
Natalie Dupree Cooks is made possible in part by Publix Supermarkets. Publix is pleased to support this and other quality public broadcasting programs.